Hello and welcome to Edison TV. In our offices today, we have Eric Manting, CEO of Mendes, and Tarek Lugau, Chief Medical Officer. We're here today to talk about Mendes's refresh strategy for lead candidate Vidadenso. So, Eric, Tarek, thanks for joining today. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. So, Eric, Mendes recently presented this refresh strategy for Vidadenso. Could you summarize some of the key takeaways for us from that latest update? Absolutely. Well, I think the most important one, Aaron, is that we've shifted from a narrow focus strategy, which was initially only on uh, AML patients after chemotherapy with an MRD positive status, so patients that were diagnosed with measurable residual disease, uh, which was the same patient population we treated in our uh, phase two, advanced two trial, uh, to a much broader strategy. And uh, that is both in acute myeloid leukemia where we will uh, address the broader uh, post-chemo patient population independent of MRD status, so MRD positive and MRD negative uh, patients. That trial has already commenced. It's the CADENCE trial, and that recruits patients uh, in, 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 in both MRD positive and negative status. And secondly, we will broaden the AML patient population towards an alternative first-line therapy called azafenitoclex. And uh, that is a patient population which is growing. Uh, but that's also in a high need of post-remission therapy to basically consolidate the initial uh, treatment success. Um, so that is capturing the broader AML patient population post-remission. And secondly, we have decided to explore chronic myeloid leukemia. And we will do that relatively quickly. First with the phase 1A, B trial that will start next year. But uh, after the initial results of that trial, we have also already prepared for a phase 2A trial. Uh, that's a very interesting patient population because it's relatively large. Also compared to AML, uh, CML patients is a, uh, re represent a growing part of the myeloid malignancies. Uh, but on the patient level, the big medical need there is to basically uh, allow patients to be taken off drugs. So CML is in principle under control with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there's, Tarek will comment on it, but there are different um, variants of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, these patients have to take drugs lifelong. Uh, whereas with immunotherapy, you can establish uh, immune control over residual disease and allow patients uh, to be taken off drugs successfully. So that is a very uh, high-level summary of our new strategy. But in a nutshell, it means we will much broaden the addressable patient population with Vidvenza. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. That's a, that's a nice summary. Could you maybe elaborate now on what really drove this refresh strategy and why now? Absolutely. Well, I think two things were important, Aaron. First of all, um, you always have to adapt to changing situations. So when you start a phase one, the world is different when you complete it and you start a phase two. And now we've completed the phase two and the world has changed again. So on the one hand, we were adapting to that already by combining with oral azacitidine, which got approved uh, during our phase two trial, which was a, a single agent, so monotherapy trial. So the new trial, the cadence trial that I described, is in combination with oral azacitidine. But also other things have changed. So also, for example, first-line treatment of AML is changing with the successful introduction of azafenitoclax as an alternative for chemotherapy. So you have to adjust as a company to that changing reality. And the last part of it is that uh, MRD, measurable residual disease, is constantly being monitored uh, in the treatment of AML. It also allows doctors to adjust therapy, for example, if the disease is changing uh, uh, its genetic makeup and you have to adjust, for example, targeted therapies to specific mutations. So MRD is used in a very dynamic way, but it's not a black and white phenomenon. As I also mentioned in the beginning, also patients without measurable residual disease very often still have residual disease. You just don't detect it. Um, so MRD is not as black and white a criterion as we sometimes hope it to be. Uh, which means that it's also maybe not the best inclusion criterion for uh, a phase three registration trial. So with the new strategy, we've now adapted not only to the changing first-line landscape, but also to the more dynamic use of MRD, and we don't exclude uh, patients on MRD status. That is, I think, the most important driver. Uh, CML uh, was uh, driven by two things. First of all, we got a lot of feedback from the uh, medical scientific community from doctors wanting to treat patients with CML with this product because it allows them hopefully to have more successful treatment-free remissions. But also, and very importantly, uh, Tarek Mangal joined us as, uh, as chief medical uh, in May. And uh, yeah, Tarek, of course, was uh, on the one hand bringing a lot of uh, hemato-oncological experience, which allowed us to have much more access to key opinion leaders and industry that is relevant in making this kind of strategy choices. 
uh, but also he has a very long and deep background in chronic myeloid leukemia. So it also helped us to shape up our strategy to enter CML as an indication. Fantastic. So our first question for you, Tarek, is with these refresh plans, could you maybe talk about how this might expand the opportunity for Vidadensil, specifically in the AML space? Yeah, so um, just to recap, the uh, so AML overall still remains a deadly disease. Yeah. Um, despite all the uh, advances we've made um, in the different therapies, targeting the vulnerabilities which are driving the looking cell, the overall survival uh, remains quite poor at five years, including for those who are eligible for stem cell transplant, and this is despite the improvements in allogeneic stem cell transplant. So the, uh, at Mendes, the, uh, the, the initial AML study, um, uh, the Cadence trial, uh, which is ongoing, um, is looking at a particular co cohort of patients who have achieved a complete remission uh, following uh, in intensive chemotherapy, but they continue to have a what we call measurable residual disease um, or not. Measurable residual disease it simply means uh, no evidence of disease using routine morphological detection. So we've been, uh, the trial is a randomized trial where we look at our uh, immune therapy, VD Denso, combined with the approved uh, drug for maintenance therapy as a cytidine. So th this trial would just look at this one area for patients who are receiving intensive chemotherapy. What is happening is that uh, people are looking at less intensive regimens which can achieve complete remission. And then uh, it, the idea would be to see if that could be curative on the longer term. Because at the present time, the standard of care for the less intensive is, is, is two uh, targeted drugs, venetoclax and azacitidine, but they are not curative. So therapy has to be continued until patients continue to progress. So we are developing this novel trial on the notion that this will enhance the activity of these two drugs. Um, so we would bring in viridenso when patients have achieved a complete remission with the less intensive regimen, and then uh, offer the viridenso and continue the um, uh, the uh, venetoclax and azacitidine um, thereafter. If the trial is positive, then this would obviously lead to a bigger trial, and that would be a randomized trial where we'll be able to see also if there is a point at which you could discontinue the drug so patient could actually be cured. So this way, we are expanding the, uh, the AML arena from a narrow area for a patient that is saving intensive chemotherapy to a much broader area where patients are receiving less intensive chemotherapy. Fantastic. Thanks, Tarek. Moving the focus on now to, to CML. Uh, this is a new indication for Mendes, though we've seen that the potential has been there as presented at ASH previously. So could you maybe summarize some of the key unmet needs in CML? Yeah. And then talk to us about how Mendes' strategy looks yeah. to address that. Yeah, so CML is, a, is, is an extremely interesting disease, also very close to my heart, having spent so much time doing the translational research in this disease. And this is the disease um, which, as recently as uh, 26, 27 years ago, was a fatal disease. You know? And with the introduction of the targeted uh, therapy and the first targeted therapy, which was introduced in 2001, uh, imatinib, Literally overnight, we were able to make a fatal disease into a potentially curable disease. But what we have learned is that the, it is not an absolute cure with this therapy. It is what we would call an operational cure. So the majority of the patients are able to, uh, to reduce the leukemic burden to such a low level um, where they're able to have a life expectancies, which is not dissimilar from a general population, uh, and are able to, uh, to continue doing whatever they wanted to do. And a small minority of them may not require specific anti-CML therapy. Um, so, so that straight away identified a, a, an unmet need 
that the majority of the patients need to continue therapy for long periods of time. And that exposes them to the notion of chronic toxicity, both physical and, of course, financial. Physical toxicity generally can impact the quality of life, uh, but it can also sometimes be associated with potentially life-threatening problems like cardiovascular diseases and so on. So many efforts have been looking at uh, notions of discontinuing these targeted therapies, we call them tyrosine kinase inhibitors, safely and effectively. And it's a concept which is known as treatment-free remission. The problem is that it is only successful in half of the patients so far. And even those half who achieve the treatment-free remission, if you follow them up for longer periods of time, for example, 10 years, 75% of them will relapse and will require alternative therapy. So it's interesting that just ahead of this therapy, we had already learned the lesson of the importance of immunotherapy in, in CML. And that was from the interferon alpha era, which was the therapy of choice before the imatinib was approved the patient was not eligible for stem cell transplant. And of course, stem cell transplant works because of its immune effect. So people have been looking at ways of how do you optimize the delivery of treatment-free remission, and then how do you maintain that once you have achieved it? So this is where we come in. So we, uh, we have designed two studies. First is, of course, to test the safety of it then so uh, in CML, and that will be first in human. Uh, and then if, if there are no problems with that, we will also look at the efficacy signal to see it, if it had the potential to impact the treatment-free remission. And then the second study will be a larger study, which will look at those patients who have failed their first attempt at the treatment-free remission, and now they're getting ready for the second one. Fantastic. Thank you. So Mendes recently entered into a collaboration with a biopharmaceutical company. Now, appreciate you might not be able to disclose full details. Could you talk to us a bit about how this might sort of expand the potential for Vididensil further and maybe touch upon whether it might apply to any other so your solid tumor programs, for example? Sure. Well, I think uh, there's always two natural um, uh, points in time in the, in the development of a drug where you can partner. And that's either uh, at the end of development, when you are closer to the market. And in our case, for example, we are combining Vitadensel with the new standards of care, being oral azacitidine, but also the azafenitoclex that we discussed. Um, the other side is early, when you have an idea that something could work synergistically, and you basically want to test it as early as possible before you go into the clinic. So the new collaboration we have is a preclinical collaboration where we test a novel concept, where we combine uh, the immunotherapy aspect, which is brought in by Vitadensel, with a targeted approach, which allows the immune system to better find cancer cells. And that combination is very logical. Uh, and we're testing that now in, uh, in AML, but it's very logical. And also more companies have adapted to this strategy of combining immunotherapy with targeted therapy, that it may extend to other indications. As you know, we have a phase one trial in ovarian cancer. We have shown successfully the induction of tumor-directed responses in that indication, but that is typically also an indication which may benefit from combination therapy. So this first collaboration is focused on AML, but it certainly may also be a step up to, uh, to, to broader collaborations. Excellent. So before we wrap up today, could you maybe briefly summarize some of the expected timelines of these refresh plans and the key milestones that investors should account for across the next 12 to 18 months? Sure. Let's focus on the, on the updated strategy, which is around the myeloid malignancies. So on the one hand, we have an ongoing trial, and that is recruiting nicely, which is also what we disclosed uh, with the press release some weeks ago. Uh, it's a trial that's being run in Australia, uh, led by a professor called Andrew Way. Um, it's a very important trial because this is the first time we have the broader patient population, both MRD positive and MRD negative, in combination with all laser cited in. So that is where we will expect initial readouts in the first half of this year, that will hopefully, uh, sorry, of 2026, that will hopefully confirm uh, that this combination is feasible, um, both in terms of safety and maybe initial signs of efficacy. Then we have the second trial that we will have to start in the course of next year, focused on the azafenitoclex treated patients. That trial is open label, will also quite quickly deliver at least initial signs of a confirmation of safety, but also hopefully some initial signs of feasibility and efficacy. 
Um, in chronic myeloid leukemia, we of course enter into a new indication. And first and foremost, it's always most important to establish safety. So the first in human data will come from the first part of a phase 1AB trial, so from the first 1A part of that trial, uh, and we'll have to show safety and hopefully also some initial signs of, uh, of efficacy. Uh, but very importantly, we have already prepared for the phase 1B part and also in a separate center um, uh, for a phase 2A trial in, in, in CML focused spe specifically on, uh, on treatment-free remission, which is, of course, what we want to accomplish or we want to improve uh, TFR success in CML. The first in human data we also expect already in the first half of next year, and that will then also allow us to move forward in CML. So I think there's quite a lot of milestones already in the course of next year that will very explicitly you know, support our, uh, our, our development strategy in myeloid malignancies, and those are the main ones to look forward to. Excellent. That's all the time we have today. But if our audience would like to learn more, please refer to the content we have freely accessible at edisongroup.com. Thank you again for the time. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah.